everyone. I'm Dr. Yosefa Fogel Rubel, and this is One on One Women Talk Torah, a series brought to you by Matan Women's Institute for Torah Study. Welcome back to Matan's One on One podcast. If you would like to sponsor a podcast episode in honor or in memory of a loved one, please contact the Matan office via telephone or email us at podcast at matan.org.il. That's podcast at matan.org.il. Each week we spend 30 minutes speaking about a seminal figure or idea on that week's Parsha. Today I have the pleasure of welcoming back Rabbanit Nechama Goldman Barish, Matan scholar, graduate, and faculty member, to speak about Parshat Pekudei, the final parsha in the Book of Shmot. Nechama, it's great to have you here. Hi, Yosefa. It's great to be here. <laughs> uh, we have the distinct honor to speak today about uh, about Leon Cass, who I think he really also he only came into my life in the past two years or so. Uh, I think everyone has to have their gateway into how, how they meet him. Uh, but just a bit about, about who he is. Uh, Leon Cass was born on February 12th, 1939. Uh, by profession, he's an American physician, scientist, educator, and a public intellectual. He is many things. He was a bioethicist. He has written many books. Uh, but we are here to speak about him uh, and his commentary on the book of Shmot. He wrote a commentary on Brishit and Shmot after spending years, years, years having study groups in the University of Chicago. And he writes all about that process in his introduction to the book of Brishit. He, at this point, doesn't refer to himself as a bioethicist. He just refers to himself as a, as a humanist. And he has become sort of this, at this point, older uh, voice of virtue among the very complex landscape that is current American culture. I'll also say that over 20 years ago, he wrote with his wife, who who passed away a few years ago, uh, they wrote a book sort of on teaching young adults how to court. Uh, they felt that it was a lost art. And so he he's really tried to to bring this sort of language and to re reignite or reintroduce a language that he feels used to exist, but doesn't really exist in the, in the broader American culture anymore. So, um, those are some of the reasons why I find him fascinating and moving, but Nahama, I'm curious as to why you wanted to talk about him today. So I first heard Leon Cass speak at a Tikva sponsored event. He actually spoke about literature. I believe we looked at a Hawthorne short story. I didn't really know about his immersion into biblical text until later. Um, but really it started with a disagreement I had with my colleague, Rabbi Yehuda Seif, um, over the topic of courtship. I read, uh, hmm. Leon Cass's chapter and I hated it. And so, um, Yehuda brought me into his class and we had this debate. And one of the reasons I kind of resisted what he was saying is I felt he was, um, romanticizing a world that was. And as a feminist, I felt that, um, he was ignoring the price women paid for that very romantic world and, and the need for a different model, um, in, in today's, uh, in today's reality. Um, but, Nonetheless, I picked up his book of Bray Sheet and I was blown away. Hmm. And, um, and I just found his language, his ideas, uh, the way he was reading the stories so compelling. Uh, it was, you know, as someone who has studied and taught Parsha for many years, I just felt there was a newness. Um, there was a reverence to the way he approached the text and yet, because he was coming from outside of orthodoxy, something he talks about his in, in his introduction. He, he's, he's a Jew, but he's right. not doesn't have any religious background. He doesn't have any religious background. I think he came from a very secular family. Uh, he gained an ownership and an agency and a deep love for the biblical text that drew me in. And there wasn't any sort of um, necessity, really, to constantly take into consideration what came before because of his background. And as a result, uh, there was nothing, I would say, uh, difficult for me in his reading. Uh, it was just very compelling and very beautiful. And so when I heard about the book of Exodus, I grabbed it and I've been, I've been using it very, uh, in my Parsha class, I've been referring a lot to his ideas and his wording and, um, some of them very much align with some of my own thoughts and how they've developed over the years. And some of them just allow me to expand and go deeper on, um, on stories that I thought I knew. And so there's something very exciting about discovering a new 
voice, but because of his age and his stage in life, there's so much depth and wisdom to it. It's, it's really quite incredible. Here's a short audio clip in which Leon Cass describes his study approach. His voice echoes the wisdom he has accumulated over a lifetime of virtue. I generally teach almost all books that I teach in a wisdom-seeking spirit. I mostly teach great books, and I read them um, to try to understand them as the author understood them. I'm not just learning about the book from the outside, but I'm trying to live with the book as a friend. Um, And I do this with almost all the books that I teach, even books that to begin with I don't like or don't agree with, in the belief that this book might just contain the most important thing I need to know and that I could never learn if it weren't for this book. I'll add a little bit about his his sources and his background. He is not familiar with the world of Chazal. He's not familiar with rabbinic literature, and that's clear in what he says. He does, in so many analyses, come to a lot of conclusions that are very much in alignment with that. Sources that he'll quote, particularly, let's say, in his in his study of Sefer Breshit, he relies a lot on extremely erudite well-based uh, textual study that's available in English. So, for example, he quotes Kasuto all the time, which our listeners know because I like to quote him at least every third episode. Um, so he'll quote Kasuto, and he's quoting a number of other modern scholars, but he's what he aims to do, and he says this in both of his introductions, is that he's aiming to suggest a philosophical interpretation. Uh, he doesn't use words like literary because he, because it's not his training, um, but he, what he basically says is that he's looking at it as a whole. He's not looking at it from the classic biblical criticism perspective. He's not looking to take apart scriptures. He's looking, he's trying to see their wholeness and their virtue and to look at it from the eyes of an older secular uh, scholar, but uh, but look to it for what it can teach uh, and really look at Torah for the sake of learning. Uh, and there's something really beautiful about it. And I agree with you that he has a reverence and a, a depth that is sort of unparalleled and his writing is sweeping. And he also sometimes offers a lot of these excursions. He goes off his chapters can sometimes be a little bit long and he'll go off on these pieces about law or about governance or about science in the particular case, the beginning of Sefer Breshit, where they're really just these pearls because you're not going to find them. Even in the most erudite commentaries, they're not there. And he sort of puts them all into this beautiful package. So we'll hopefully gift uh, our audience today with a few direct quotes from what he writes, but we really suggest that you, you go in and buy the books. They're really phenomenal commentaries and, and well worth having having on your shelf. So with that introduction, uh, let's let's transition to Chama into his basic sketch of how he sees the book of Sefer Shemot. Um, I'll just read one, one line of his. He says, I undertook this study mainly to explore basic questions of people formation. What makes a people a people? What forms their communal identity, holds them together, guides their lives? To what do they look up? For what should they strive? And he explains that the book of Shemot really explores these questions through two intersecting stories. One is the founding of the Israelite nation through their being saved and taken out of Egypt and their growing knowledge of God through the experience of revelation. And he says that in order to counter, obviously to further those two goals and to counter the ways that humankind can naturally come apart, uh, God sets to establish an enduring connection with them um, and he builds this nation and this connection on three basic pillars. One is through their the nation's shared experience and lasting memory of oppressive slavery. The second is through a covenantal, comprehensive law that governs all aspects of life that utilize str- constrained encouragement and are meant to uplift. And the third is through the tabernacle, through the Mishkan, which is, of course, our, our topic today for our final, our final, uh, Parsha in Sefer Shemot. And he says that the point of the tabernacle is to be the embodiment of their aspiration to constantly remain in contact with that which is highest in the world. And so that's how he sees the book of Shemot developing. You have first the the experience and the memory of Egypt, which are the first few parshiot. You have the the Parshat Mishpatim specifically, but that intense, detailed 
um, unit of uh, of law, and then you have the parshiot of the of the mishkan at the end, which are looking to make their connection with God permanent through that through that structure and what it represents. So I'll just um, pick up with what you said, Yosefa, that one of the ideas I really love that he develops throughout the book is the idea that at God's initiative, the people become co-partners in this venture of creating a nationhood with God at its center. And ultimately, um, there's a interdependency Right, that in order for us to become people, we have to acknowledge God, but God also has to allow for space where we essentially partner and uh, partner with God in the venture. Um, I do want to add one thing he notes also in terms of the theme of, um, of, of Shmot, uh, in terms of being able to plumb from its depths kind of wisdom that's relevant directly for uh, for us, for our generation, um, or for all generations, essentially. Uh, and he says as follows, people who have suffered estrangement and deprivation are more likely to feel sympathy for strangers and compassion for the needy. People who have experienced tyranny are more likely to treasure freedom, especially if they have struggled to attain it. People nourished collectively in the wilderness are more likely to be grateful for the blessings of existence. And so he sees there a paradigm of worthy nationhood, right? Here, the story of Exodus on one hand is a particular story, but the experience of the people as they move into this partnership with God around God's word and God's law, and as they co-create this space in which God will reside, really is also reflecting the shared experiences that brought them from free, uh, from from freedom through slavery to freedom again, and freedom around this uh, collective purpose. I think also that when we mention the word partnership, it will always send me back to all the Midrashim that describe Har Sinai as, as a wedding. Uh, and I think that it's also, you have the wedding and then you have to create your home together. So you have, you have the Har Sinai and then here you have the building, the Mishkan, which is, which is the Ma'on. It's the, it's the sanctuary and the resting place of God. Like all couples who come together in a partnership need to event, need to establish their home together. So we're, we're deep and at this point towards the end of that, of that home building process. And, um, and yeah, the, one of the Midrashim that kept coming up for me as I was reading, uh, throughout the end of the book was a Midrash Vayikhuli Truma. It's in Vayikra Rabba actually, but it's quoting the verse at the very beginning where we're commanded to take, um, to, to begin donating offerings and, and collecting, uh, voluntary, uh, resources for the Mishkan. Uh, the verse says Vayikhuli Truma, which on the face of it seems to mean like, you know, I want you to donate things for me. But the Midrash says something much more, uh, much more insightful and I think very, very deep, which is God says, Kuli Truma, take me as the Truma, understanding that if, if we don't acknowledge God, if we don't invite God into the Mishkan, then essentially what role is God going to have in our, uh, in our journey and in, in our, uh, role as, as God's people, meaning this, this vulnerability almost, Kviyachal, but I, I think that God Kastan, makes himself vulnerable to yes, us because yes. we could have built the house and then said, uh, oh, you're not allowed in it, right? But the point is he wants us to bring him into the house. Yes. And that's a choice, right? And particularly, you know, we had the parshiot that have us, you know, being active partners in building the Mishkan before the Chet Egel, and then a repeat of those parshiot. And you know, all the uh, the parshanim, the commentaries over the generations have discussed why the repetitiveness. Why do we need it twice? But um, it makes a lot of sense in this scenario, like in a marriage where there's an enormous rupture, right? This active, the activism, the idea that we continue to show initiative even in the aftermath of rupture, um, shows the depth of the commitment of both parties to one another, and particularly the people, right? Showing that really that was maybe a blip, right? The Chet HaEgel uh, was one moment, but it wasn't indicative of, of the larger picture or the larger goal in how we view our relationship with God. Or to look at it slightly differently, there's a great idea that I I think about and, and speak about it uh, certainly with couples, is this idea that in the long-term relationship, you might, please God, be married to the same person for a long time, but you'll have a number of different marriages. And so it's sort of that we have like two 
two chapters in our in our marriage with God or two two uh building two building sections and in between you have the rupture you have that moment of you can call it adultery you can call it a moment of of utter catastrophe or breakdown but then we have you know we we get back there and it's not because things are the same nahama things aren't the same but we have another chapter that in which we have to recreate a marriage and it's almost a new one of course it's working off of many of the foundations that were laid before but but it's another chapter in that relationship uh, and, you know, I'll take that even further. First of all, yes, I also, in, in the counseling I do, and in my own marriage, I'm married almost 30 years, um, there are moments of betrayal that are not betrayal on the level of cheta egel or adultery, but these moments where we hurt our partners, and sometimes it's deliberate, and sometimes it's a little malicious, and how do you, uh, how do you reconnect and um, smooth over some of, some of that pain? Um, and, you know, in a committed relationship, both between husband and wife, and I would say also with parents and children, in any committed lifelong relationship, uh, the question of how to take initiative in the aftermath of the rupture is a lifelong work. It requires resilience, and it requires the willingness of both sides to make moves towards one another. And I think that's what we're seeing here. And and what Cass then does, and I know uh, you showed me, Yosefa, before the podcast that Rabbi Sachs, Rabbi Jonathan Sachs, also develops this idea, and uh, I'm, I'm sure it's prevalent in other midrashim or other earlier strata of commentary, the idea of the creation being completed with the work of the Mishkan, that there are some wonderful psukim that really tie together the language of creation and the language of the work on the Mishkan, and um, and this idea that uh, it's a cooperative project here, and I'm quoting Cass, between creature, created in God's image, and creator, and the tabernacle stands as a completion of creation, not as a summary or as a microcosm, but as the culmination. And that's really quite an incredible idea, that God's creation produced a hospitable world in which human beings can live, but it requires also God's law. God's tabernacle built for him by human beings offer the rituals by which they can aspire to be holy as the Lord their God is holy. And I'll just quote one more line, which I think is just uh, incredibly beautiful. The creation itself will be complete only when the creator is known and intimately present in the life of his godlike creature. And so it was for their mutual benefit that God took up with Israel in the first place, that they may come to know him and that he may be part of their lives forever. Right. So I'm drawn over and over again to this idea. It's very much also reflected in Heschel, God in search of man, man in search of God. Uh, this idea that there is a yearning, like a chatan and a kala, one for the other. Um, God remains God, of course, and there is a hierarchy in the God-people relationship. However, what we're seeing here is pushing that hierarchy a little bit to the side, the intimacy of the space that we can create when we invite God in intimately as part of our lives, even though ultimately we have to obey God, right? We have to follow all those laws, and it's not a simple relationship to be in, but it's one in which there really can be a, a yearning for both sides towards this intimacy within the space that we ultimately create. You know, I'll add that some of the words that that parallel between the creation and and the creation of the Mishkan is uh, make vayaa si vayar. Um, to bless, to sanctify, work and behold. There are a number of, of significant words that parallel in each. And while there are many midrashim that echo this idea that, of course, uh, the rabbinic commentary sense this connection as well, one of them is, uh, it's in the Sifra and the commentary on Sefer Vayikra. It's also in, in the Bavli and Megillah, uh, 10b. Um, it has been taught that on the day that the tabernacle was inaugurated, there was joy before the Holy One, blessed be He, as on the day when heaven and earth were created. And that, just if we can sidebar for a moment about the way Chazal speak, sometimes Chazal will say the parallel outright, but more often they do things like that, right? They parallel two events so that you then, the reader, go in and find all of those parallels. So as we said, Cass isn't going to be the one who's going to be quoting Chazal, in this case Rabbi Sachs does, but, uh, but that idea is obviously uh, a moving one, and I think that we would be we would be missing something if we didn't come away with that um, when we read about the construction of the of the Mishkan. So 
one thing I want to um, bring up, Yosefa, is um, Cass's analysis of Moshe. And we don't have enough time for me to really develop um, the development of Moshe's character throughout the book. It's really quite phenomenal to see Moshe. You can check out earlier podcasts. We did that in a number of Okay, ago. great. I'm sure you did. <laughs> but there's one particular moment that I want to talk about, which is, and, then, and then I want to talk about what's happening at the end of uh, Pekude. Um, in the relationship with Yitra, one of the things, and, and this is just so reflective of Cass's way of thinking, is that Yitro comes and sees that Moshe has, a taken, has taken the entire burden of the nation upon himself. And we all know that that's not a good thing, and he gives him, uh, he gives him advice. But one of the things he says to Moshe, which I think is so interesting, because in my reading, Yitro goes back, and he's the Kohen Midjan, and, and he does not convert and he does not join the Jewish people, uh, Israelite people. He goes back to his own life and his own religious journey. But he keeps saying to Moshe, talk to your God about what you're doing. Take advice with your God. Mo- Yitro sees the intimacy and the potential and the need for Moshe to um, to consult with God, not to take it all upon himself. And when I come to the end of Pikude, the very end of Pikude has Moshe unable to go into the Mishkan. And um, and I have to say, again, it's one of those moments you've read the story many times. And okay, so the cloud um, the cloud fills the Mishkan. It says, Vayichas anan et al moed uchvod Adonai malei et ha-mishkan. Right? We have the, the cloud filling the entire Oel moed, and the glory of God the, is is filling up the Mishkan, the tabernacle. V'lo yachol Moshe lavo el al moed. And Moshe, even Moshe, cannot come into the Oel Moed, ki shachan alav ha'anan, um, because the cloud is resting um, on the Oel Moed, and uchvod Adonai malei at hamishkan. And um, this idea that we're reminded at the end of the book that Moshe is mortal is such an important point, because as Moshe gains in strength, in leadership, in power, in agency, he begins to own the person he needs to become, and he reflects the divine glory on his face, it's very important at the end of Shmot, where he has had this role. It's a godlike role. It's one of the things Cass says, that um, Moshe is not looking for power, but he's in danger of being associated with God, of being a god, being Pharaoh-like. And, um, and, and that's one of the, uh, complexities in the aftermath of the golden calf that has to be resolved when Moshe disappears and so on. But at the end, the book reminds us that ultimately God is God and even Moshe cannot approach the Mishkan. And I thought, um, that was a very powerful message that ultimately human beings are limited. There are boundaries, even to a Moshe Rabbeinu, uh, to how far we can go in our intimacy with God, that we can, we can have intimacy. We we can invite God in, we can follow God's law, but it's very important at that time, and I would say even today, to recognize there are boundaries that can't be crossed. I think that this piece about Moshe is interesting because in a certain way, it also connects his inability to go into Eretz Yisrael. Uh, there, I think it had to do with his leadership and that his leadership era had ended. And here I agree with you that what's at the basis of it is are a number of things, but has much to do with creating boundaries between that which is divine and that which is human. And Moshe, who who represents the the most blurring you can do between those boundaries, so that that boundary needs to be created. Also, as you said, connected to what he had already asked for from God, and the confusion that we had had in Parshat Kitisa. Um, but but I feel like there is some connection there between Moshe not being able to go into the Mishkan and Moshe being stopped from going to Eretz Yisrael. We sort of take him at the cusp of things and then and then we make him stop and there's something a little bit uh, painful about those moments but i think that i agree with you that there's this point here that that needs to be made the boundary that needs to be created and you know cast then notes that you know he's brought them from terror before the lord to joyful builders of a tent right and the per- and and yet he has to surrender the exclusive role of mediating between the people and god to the priests who are going to continue after he's gone right yeah. and it seems like he's already the foreshadowing, I love that, of, you know, not going into the Mishkan uh, at that at the end of Shemot and not being able to go into the land of Israel. The awareness that when he dies, there is a full stop to what he brought to the people. And yet his brother Aaron will continue with his children, his grandchildren, and so on. He's being taught that lesson um, throughout. And as painful as it is, I would suggest he is um, resilient and he recognizes that that is 
uh, what is going to be asked of him. And it's obviously healthier, meaning no one is ever going to deny Moshe's uniqueness and his contribution to, to Am Yisrael. But at the same time, there's all these lessons of humility that are being put in along the way. Mm-hmm. So to start winding down this brief discussion about Lilian Cass's beautiful work on Sefer Shemot, uh, I just wanted to bring you a few quotes from what he speaks about. Uh, he himself says, what can we learn from Israel and from the, the book of Exodus? And he says that one general point emerges simply from the three-pillared structure of Israel's founding that we mentioned before, uh, of the joint experience of slavery, of the covenantal law, and of the tabernacle. And he says, can a people endure and flourish if it lacks a shared national story, accepted laws and morals, and an aspiration to something higher than its own comfort and safety? Can a devotion to technological progress, economic prosperity, and private pursuits of happiness sustain us when our story is contested or our morals are weakened? and our national dedication abandoned? I doubt it. Uh, And he says, living increasingly between technocracy and hedonism, defined not by our duties or callings, but by our devices and whims, we are feasted in body, but famished in soul, and our national fabric is unraveling. Biblical Israel is, for deeper reasons, a paradigm of worthy nationhood. It is a particular people, but with a universal law. The bond of kinship and shared history creates attachments that induce people to care concretely for one another, while the universal law recognizes and advances the dignity of all human beings. And what I love also in so much of what he writes is that, again, we explained he's not coming from a religious background, but the significance he finds in the minute details of the laws that are expressed in Sefer Shemot is something that he takes with him and he brings into so many of his commentaries. Uh, and he says in a way that, again, for maybe a religious listener, it seems obvious because we grow up or grew into that mindset. Uh, but this idea that no people can become deepened, can be everlasting, or can have an everlasting contribution to the world if they are not built upon those pillars of this universal perspective, but also with law and with an, with an identity Entity that's very particular, uh, and that's a piece I don't know among so many Nechama that move me in, in what I in what I've read of his. Yeah, and I think it's so uh, relevant in a postmodern world where people are constantly looking for objective truth. Cass is saying it's not about objective truth; it's about our you know our history, our our past, present, and future. In fact, eh, yeah, share eh, yeah. If I go back to something that I've taken actually into my tefillah, thanks to Cass, right? He translates eh, yeah, share eh, yeah. I will be what I will be. Um, that idea that God will be to each of us what God will be, meaning we have to define what God is to us and then, and God is there. Um, this idea that, you know, those, those pillars essentially create an, an anchor, something deep and solid and something that we can, um, uh, evolve continuously from. It's where I actually want to take the end. The last thing I want to mention is this idea that he writes, Um, unlike the so-called divinities of nature, God moves not in circles, but towards a goal. In other words, God is not, it's not circular like the sun, the moon, right? The orbits and, and they just continuously go in circles. There's a goal. And the truth is in all relationships, there should be goal setting and God sets out goals for us in order to follow God and be in relationship to God. And then Cass continues, the people who follow him do likewise, right? They're moving towards a goal throughout all their journeys. And not only their spatial journeys, they are blessed to be able to follow the path he leads them on. The end of Exodus invites us to accompany the children of Israel on their future journeys, journeys still unfinished and still following the Lord. And to me, here we are thousands of years later since that, that story took place. And we're still on an ongoing journey. The goal continues to be creating relationship and the relationship moves forward and backward and ebbs and flows. But there are, is goal setting in our relationship with God and even, you know, just as much, if not more so with one another. And that's what gives relationships uh, any sort of depth and meaning and purpose. And so uh, I want to wish us all that we continue to be on this, on this incredible journey that started so many thousands of years ago, and we are still inviting God into our own uh, individual and familial and communal tense of meeting, which is our learning Torah together. Um, thank you so much, Nechama, for being here. Again, we were speaking about Leon Cass's Founding God's Nation, reading Exodus. It came out not long ago, 
I think last year. Yeah, it came out last year. I see that here. And it was his his initial volume on the book of, of Brashit came out in 2003. So he spent many, 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 many years. It's also what I love about these books that he, he also in his footnotes will quote you students who, who he learned from or interpretations he heard from them. And you really feel that you have such a tremendous mind, heart, and soul who's been looking with really modern eyes. Uh, at, at, at our Torah, at his Torah, uh, and thinking about it with people, with students, with colleagues, and, and bringing you uh, the fruits of, of all of their collective labors. So again, uh, it's been a pleasure to speak with you, Nechama, and to speak about the work of, of Leon Kess. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. I hope you enjoyed this conversation as much as I did. I am Dr. Yosefa Fogel Rubel, and this is One on One Women Talk Torah, a series brought to you by Matan Women's Institute for Torah Study. Thank you to the entire Matan team for their input. Please do one on one and women's Torah learning a small favor by sharing this podcast with family and friends so that we can reach new listeners. You can stream and download these episodes on Spotify, iTunes, and Matan's website, and write us any feedback at podcast at matan.org.il. That's podcast at matan.org.il. Thanks for listening, everyone.